Well, we turn now to an institutional context that is familiar to just about everyone here this afternoon in one way or another, our colleges and universities. We have three great presentations lined up before the Q&A session with the scholars who have joined us for this panel. The first presentation is titled, Education Yields Access, Activism and the Formation of Higher Education, 1964 to Present. Stephen M. Bradley is Associate Professor of History and African American Studies at St. Louis University, and I believe he was recently appointed as Chair of African American Studies at Loyola Marymount University. He's interested in the efforts and abilities of black college students to change not only their scholastic environments, but also the communities that surround their institutions of higher learning. His first book, Harlem vs. Columbia University, Black Student Power in the Late 1960s, published by the University of Illinois Press, won the Phyllis Wheatley Book Prize. He is co-editor of Alpha Phi Alpha, A Legacy of Greatness, The Demands of Transcendence, and his work has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Rolling Stone, and the Chronicle of Higher Education. Our second presentation, today's Campus Culture Wars, sequel, series, or never-ending story, poses a question that will be explored by L.D. Burnett, the 2017-18 Teaching Fellow in History at the University of Texas at Dallas. Dr. Burnett is a regular contributor to the award-winning blog of the Society for U.S. Intellectual History. She received her PhD in Humanities and the History of Ideas from UT Dallas in 2015. Her forthcoming book, tentatively titled Canon Wars, The 1980s Western Civ Debates at Stanford and the Triumph of Neoliberalism in Higher Education, is under contract with the University of North Carolina Press. The final presentation in this panel will be given by Matthew Westner, who also poses a question. Why are relatively few students the victims of political indoctrination? Unraveling higher education's persuasion paradox. Dr. Westner is associate professor of political science and public policy at Penn State University in Harrisburg. He specializes in the study of politics and academia. With April Kelly Westner and the late Stanley Rothman, he co-authored a book titled The Still Divided Academy, How Competing Visions of Power, Politics, and Diversity Complicate the Mission of Higher Education. Profiles of his research on politics and academia have appeared in the Chronicle of Higher Education, the Christian Science Monitor, the Wall Street Journal, and the New York Times. In 2016, Professor Westner was elected chair of the Penn State University Faculty Senate for the 2017-18 academic term. With that, I'll turn things over to Stefan. Right. Okay. So, I have to say that I have been uh, thrilled with the kind of diversity that I've seen here uh, over the past day or so. Uh, I also have to say that, that I'm thankful for the invitation uh, to come out here. Uh, I'm, I'm quite thankful to, uh, to, to Scott St. Louis. I think that's an awesome name. Uh, that's, a, that's a very good name. And then uh, also thankful to uh, Gleaves Whitney, uh, as well as uh, the rest of the people who work uh, for the Hornstein Center. Uh, Morgan Eaton uh, and my new friend, Ann O'Keefe, uh, the community people that I got to, to, to hang out with last night. Uh, they were educators and educated and, and all around good people. Uh, thanks to uh, there's a lady named Ann Kuzak. Uh, oh, there she is, right there, who uh, gave me a book yesterday. Look, Grand Rapids is the place to be, I'm telling you. <laughs> Grand Rapids. And finally, thanks to the people who prepared and, and, and served the food uh, that we're enjoying. The people who paid for the food are pretty nice people, too. But, but the people who prepared and served the food, uh, there's one little sister that, 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 that did a whole bunch of stuff, and so I'm thankful for her uh, as well. And so. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. I bring you greetings from the place where in August 2014, my students shouted, hands up, don't shoot. I bring you greetings from the place where in October 2014, my students hollered, if we don't get it, shut it down. And I bring you greetings from the place where in November 2014, my students and many young people shouted, the whole damn system is guilty as hell. I bring you greetings from St. Louis, from Ferguson, Missouri, 
I understand currently that, that Grand Rapids is uh, having some issues regarding policing and, and certain members of the community uh, who happen to look like my nephews. And I'd, I'd be remiss if I, if I had a chance to speak on a microphone today and didn't mention uh, the recent uh, revelation that um, the officer who shot Jordan Edwards in, uh, near Dallas uh, has been charged uh, with murder. Uh, that just happened. As we go forward, I'd like us to remember, to remember this, that power concedes nothing without demand. It never has and it never w will. Those are the words of Frederick Douglass, uh, who had escaped slavery only to become a public abolitionist, which I think is fascinating in itself. If I had escaped slavery, you would never hear from me again. Uh, but he made the statement in a moment when black people suffered through chattel slavery. His words, however, would portend life in the United States for uh, people of his race, uh, but for others. His brief observation of power would provide a roadmap of politics for minority groups of all kinds, including the Tea Party. Let me say that, that, that and I, I need to make this clear, I don't believe that politics functions only by the, the rigid the rigid system of voting and, and elections and, and uh, legislating. I don't think that that's, uh, that that's all of politics. Although that's an important aspect of it. Politics, I believe, is the ability to influence policy and culture. And in this way, many, many, many more people and groups are political than we give credit for. In my newest book, I argue uh, in my newest book that I'm working on, I argue that, that white liberal administrators oversaw a certain kind of access for uh, black students, faculty, and uh, changes in the curriculum in the, in the, in the Ivy League during the, the mid-1960s. But I argue that they were, they were led to moralism and, and justice regarding race by a minority of a minority of college students, that is, uh, black students who chose to activate, to become activists. Most students weren't activists. Most black students uh, uh, were not necessarily activists. Uh, but those who chose to activate, uh, I think, influenced college and university in a way that, that we see to this day. Radical and liberal white students also affected the position of these university officials and higher education in general. Equally as important as the students was the role of what some administrators at the time called outside agitation. And that outside agitation, I think, greatly influenced high, high, higher education. So leading the charge uh, were, were people like, uh, people like A. Philip Randolph. Uh, A. Philip Randolph, uh, you'll remember, during World War II threatened to march on Washington uh, that uh, pressured Franklin Roosevelt to issue Executive Order 8802, which desegregated military industries, which provided nearly a, a million jobs uh, to open up to African Americans, which would help to send some of these young people during the 1960s to college. A. Philip Randolph also led the charge after World War II to pressure uh, Harry Truman uh, to desegregate the military with Executive Order 9981, uh, which helped African American men fight on behalf of their country uh, um, and to uh, eventually get the GI Bill, which allowed African Americans to uh, go to university. African Americans like, uh, like uh, James Meredith, uh, or well, like um, Medgar Evers, who applied to the Un University of Mississippi but was denied, but promised that he would help anybody else go to the University of Mississippi. That anybody else happened to be James Meredith, uh, who in 1962 uh, enrolled at the University of Mississippi. But it didn't happen with him just writing, uh, making an application to the university. It took agitation for him to uh, attend. The civil rights movement of the, of the post-war era uh, affected some of these uh, college leaders. Uh, I'll speak uh, specifically about uh, the president of Dartmouth College, a man by the name of John Sloan Dickey, who had been on President Truman's Civil Rights Commission. Uh, John Sloan Dickey knew quite well uh, about the lack of citizens, citizenship rights for African Americans. 
uh, also known was uh, Robert Goheen, uh, the president of Princeton University, uh, who had made the comment that, that in the effort to be in the service of nation and of all nations, Princeton University had overlooked uh, the real civil rights needs of, of citizens at home. There was the Higher Education Act, of course, uh, that influenced uh, life for students on campus. But there was an overall change in higher education that was occurring. Uh, Mrs. Kirk yesterday mentioned uh, the Berkeley free speech movement, and she mentioned Mario Savio. Uh, that opened the university to a clear shift in the relationship between students and administrators. Students at Berkeley in 64 who had been down to Mississippi to register black voters and saw the savagery of uh, attempting to involve people in the democracy um, and students who by that time could uh, participate in the Vietnam War uh, could not pass out political literature or literature on uh, um, uh, black freedom organizations on campus. Uh, this disturbed them greatly and they moved to check such an idea. During the mid-1960s, a small cadre of black students who, uh, from urban areas who had been admitted to uh, predominantly white institutions employed the methods that they saw uh, on, camp, uh, on, on the streets, uh, in, this, in the movements on the streets, the movement for freedom on the streets. They apply, employed those methods on campus. They set about creating an identity for themselves, and they pushed the envelope to include scholarly analysis of the black experience in the form of academic units like uh, black studies. And in these black studies uh, programs, and this is in the midst of a burgeoning black power movement uh, that, that, that largely riffed off the ideas of Malcolm X, uh, who is the homeboy of uh, one of our moderators, um, uh, they read works uh, by C.L.R. James and, and W.E.B. Du Bois. The campus campaigns of those students paved the way for the ethnic studies and the women's studies programs that, that uh, uh, along with African American studies, have become points of controversy in higher education debates to this day. I forgot to mention, of course, the push against parietals, uh, gendered parietals, uh, that young women and men made during the period. If you'll remember, in the late 1960s, a Barnard woman was expelled for cohabitating with her boyfriend. Students thought, if I could go off to fight a war, I can surely lay up with my boyfriend. Sorry about that, sorry. <laughs> Got a little too familiar. It started to feel good to me. I, sorry, <laughs> sorry. The recognition of students' maturity in making decisions about with whom they could socialize wasn't a gift. It was a concession. If that is, if what I've been speaking about is too much like identity politics for you, then, then, then think about how students gained a voice on campus in general. Today, students serve um, as representatives on the board of trustees and this sort of thing. That's not, that wasn't normal during, in this period, just after uh, and before World War II. In the years and decades and centuries leading to the 1960s, the university was supposed to be the parent and the students were supposed to be the children. This was the idea of in loco parentis, right? Uh, when students protested to have access to the decision-making uh, processes of the institution for which they or somebody else paid, they became caretakers for not only themselves, but I argue, for higher education in general, and eventually the nation. And so I think it's unfair to expect that you're building the world's leaders in these institutions, uh, but not encourage them to take the lead on issues of conflict and controversy. And I think that few people can probably, few people will disagree with that premise. But where people disagree is on the methodology and the methods that students and others have used to influence decision making in higher education. We're here at this very event, at this summit, to discuss civil political dialogue. Part of my overarching argument is that civil political dialogue works to an extent and that sometimes 
incivility leads to civil dialogue. A popular me method of influencing polit uh, politics on campus is, had been, uh, in the 1960s particularly, uh, had been through building takeovers, uh, sit-ins, uh, lockouts, those sorts of things. In 1968, um, and, and many can remember that year, uh, students, I'm sorry, there was Mario Savio uh, standing on top of the police car. Uh, he was supposed to be arrested. Good job, Mario. All right. But in 1968, uh, students at Columbia, at the University of Pennsylvania, at San Francisco State, all popularized protests to advance their causes. Uh, as you can see, I don't know if this has a pointer thing, but the young man in the uh, sunshades, that's Mark Rudd uh, at Columbia University. Uh, in the middle is, a, is a, an illustration talking about uh, uh, the construction of university, uh, the University City Science Center uh, near Penn's campus uh, in West Philadelphia, and it's overrun of a neighborhood called Mantua. And uh, to your far right uh, is an image of students at San Francisco State uh, University where they were protesting for a, an ethnic studies uh, college and a black studies department. And that was where the first black studies department uh, actually started. And so they popularized protest uh, um, a, uh, to advance their causes on campus. But I'll say in the, in, the, in the popular narrative, even as we remember it today, many of us can only remember that, uh, these acts of protest these acts of protest when students took over building. I mean, what's not sexy about saying, hell no, we won't go, or, or we're on strike, shut it down, or, or best yet, up against the wall, mother. <laughs> you get it, you get it. These were all refrains of the period. I, and by, yeah, yeah, I'm just quoting. I just wanted to tell the truth on history, that's all. I just want to tell the truth on history. What people don't remember as much, though, are the letters that students wrote requesting, not demanding, but requesting that their institutions detach themselves from governmental contracts that use the university for defense research, as in the case of the Institute for Defense Analyses during the Vietnam con conflict. It's hard to imagine the meetings that students asked for, the meetings and interviews that students asked for when they tried to keep the university from investing in uh, apartheid South, South Africa, uh, which, is, which was the case at Princeton University. Or the nice phone calls that students made encouraging their ed educational institutions not to displace any more residents in neighborhoods surrounding the university, which was the case at Columbia University and at the University of Pennsylvania. I have proof of students doing all these things but not making much progress. So in a most American move, when the students could not get an interview with those who wielded power at their universities, the students did what citizens interested in progress have done for centuries. They took their issues to the street, or in this case, they took their issues to the yard. Until they took over buildings, blocked entrances to offices, and sat in, decision makers did not act with a sense of urgency or feel pressure to change the way that things had always been because traditionalism reigned. Before the direct action campaigns, universities hadn't made accommodations in the curriculum um, uh, that would allow for uh, various points of view uh, that were different. That includes the uh, perspective of African Americans and people who were not in the Western tradi uh, in the Western tradition. The universities had not moved to separate it themselves from the quagmire uh, that was the Vietnam conflict at the time and part of the military industrial complex that uh, somebody with another great name, Bradley uh, Berzer, uh, just discussed. I like the Bradley part of his name. I like that. No, it took pressure to make these changes. It took pressure. Students, or if you will, shareholders, wanted decision-making power, and they got it by agitation. Back at Dartmouth College, black students were able to get a cultural center called, of all things, at Dartmouth College. Think of the Dartmouth Review. Think of all those things. 
The name of the cultural center was the El Haj Malik El Shabazz Center. <laughs> that may not mean much to you, but, but, but having a building on campus named after a black figure was, was a symbol of the university welcoming students. Today, there are similar struggles for naming. Take, for instance, Princeton University, where the university, after protest from students uh, about the university's use of Woodrow Wilson's name for the International School of uh, Public Affairs, Princeton recently named a building, uh, a new building, uh, Tony Morrison Hall. And within the Woodrow Wilson School, uh, there's an auditorium that will be named, uh, and I have to show you these, these, these students. This is the Black Justice League, and they were the ones that, that made the argument for uh, the buildings to, to, to building names to be changed, and that's when you got Toni Morrison Hall. The auditorium in, in Woodrow Wilson, in the Woodrow Wilson School, will be named uh, for Sir Arthur Lewis, uh, the renowned economist who happened to be black. Now, although some claim that students are brats for wanting to change the names and, uh, on buildings and that sort of thing, that it's uh, uh, these students turning their back on history and that sort of thing, I'd say someone took the time to name the buildings originally. Shouldn't someone take the time to name them again? And who should have the power to name? I think these are all important questions. At the base of history, and specifically this talk, is the idea of moral suasion, that is, the idea that we can appeal to mankind's better senses, versus disruption and direct action. Obviously, appealing to the better senses of mankind is preferable to protests and demonstrations. But there comes a time when students, and I'm speaking uh, uh, specifically of, of African-American students, grow weary of justifying themselves and teaching others about their own humanity. They feel as though they shouldn't have to be student, soldier, teacher, and token all at once. They have found today, what some students knew decades ago, that when moral suasion fails, agitation yields access. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Can I close this laptop? It won't hurt anything. I'm going to put mine on top of it. All right. How is everybody today? I want to thank uh, the Howenstein Center for this invitation. Thanks to Scott, who came to the U.S. Intellectual History Conference last fall and heard my panel and uh, heard me talk and invited me anyway. That was really nice of you. Uh, maybe you'll be sorry when I'm done. Maybe you won't. I don't know. Um, the title of my talk is uh, Today's Campus Culture Wars, Sequel, Series Reboot, or Never-Ending Story. Um, so, I, my title invokes Today's Campus Culture Wars, but I'm probably not going to address the particulars of current campus kerfuffles. If I do, it's going to be drive-by really quickly. Um, you know, I am as attentive to current events as the next fellow, um, but that's not my line of work. I'm, I'm a historian, and right now I am in the middle of a bear of a project. I'm writing a history of ideas in the university and a history of ideas about the university. I'm writing about changes to the curriculum and changes to campus culture, uh, changes to public perceptions of higher education, and the pivotal decades I'm looking at are the 1970s and the 1980s. I'm going to end my project, I hope, uh, in the middle of the 1990s. That is, I'm trying to end my project in the middle of the 1990s. But one of the problems with writing a history of the recent past is that more than would normally be the case, you really have to work hard to find a cutoff point. You have to find a way to mark off the object of your inquiry as past problems and not as current events. 
So I'm writing about curricular battles and campus politics and widespread consternation about the menace of political correctness and how those concerns about the fate and future of campus discourse were instrumentalized and weaponized by various groups for various ends. And I have enough work on my hands just to untangle and examine that fraught discourse from a fraught past moment. And while I'm digging to get to the bottom of all of that, lo and behold, there are fresh controversies piling up every day, fresh invocations of political correctness, of academic freedom, fresh laments over the decline of the West, a decline that people continue to insist on tracing to some professor somewhere who changed a syllabus one day in the 1980s. Uh, it just doesn't stop. It is like shoveling out the stable while the horse is still leaving souvenirs. Right. It's a hot mess. So I have made an executive decision. Um, rather than setting aside my methodological problems, I'm going to inflict them on you today. I'm, I'm just going to lay it all out here. And uh, you know, maybe this, this will help me sort some things out. And at, at the very least, I won't be, you know, it won't just be me and the horse in the stable. We can all be in there together. All right. As my title suggests, what I want to invite you to do with me today is to consider some different ways of viewing the relationship between campus controversies as they played out or as they were played up in the 1980s and campus controversies as they are playing out right now in the media today. Um, my title suggests three models. We can view what's going on now as a sequel to the campus culture wars of the 1980s or as a reboot, a series reboot of those conflicts, or as, as a remnant of the 1980s that never went away. Um, my metaphors are taken from the wor world of studio filmmaking and the age of the summer blockbuster, the age of Spielberg and George Lucas, and more recently, J.J. Abrams. So I'm going to unpack those metaphors a little bit and see if I can get any use out of them. Um, what, would what would it entail for us to see the, today's campus conflicts including the broader discourse about them, uh, as a sequel to the conflicts of an earlier era. era. What, what makes a sequel? Um, for a sequel, you need at least some of the same characters, played by the same actors where possible, continuing to develop plot lines laid down in an earlier episode of, of the franchise with all the episodes taking place in the same imaginative universe, same rules, same realities, same broader common history from which all the new episodes can pull. I guess that probably the best known example of a franchise with sequels would be the Star Wars franchise, where you have the, the Star Wars, it's called episode four, but it is the original Star Wars. Do not ever show your children Star Wars starting with episode one. That is not canon, don't do that. Start with episode four made in 1977 where we meet Luke, Leia, Han Solo, C-3PO, and R2-D2. You can follow it up with The Empire Strikes Back and then Return of the Jedi. You can leave off the first three episodes, you have my permission, they're made after, and then pick up where the, where the franchise picks up with the recent release. Um, that, that's a good example of a, of, a, of a film that made a big splash and whose characters were so powerfully uh, popular and whose merchandise tie-ins were so profitable that it uh, behooved the studio to make more of the same, using the same actors where they could. Now, a series reboot, on the other hand, um, that's where you have familiar characters in a scenario that's probably in its fundamentals familiar to, to viewers, but you have new actors in these roles. And the plot lines that develop may or may not be connected to earlier dramatizations. And probably the most recent example of a series reboot that I can think of is a Star Trek franchise where uh, we had the TV show from the 60s, movies starting with the Star Trek, uh, the motion picture in 1979, then a whole series of films and then uh, using the same actors in the same roles, then the next generation people come in. And finally in 2015, you get a, a, just a remake of the Star Trek franchise with all new actors, all new characters. But even there, there's a handoff with uh, Leonard Nimoy returning as Spock Prime. <laughs> 
Uh, he gives his blessing to his younger self, and his younger self will take the story in a different direction. Now, I would argue that in some ways, campus culture wars today's, today are a sequel to earlier conflicts. The battle over the canon, which is the main focus of my work, uh, was wrapping up in the 1980s. The controversy surrounding Stanford's Western Civ requirement was, in one view, a, a completed episode that came to a conclusion. And that conclusion, like it or not, is part of the settled past that has shaped the landscape of debates in higher education that followed. Should Toni Morrison have a place on the syllabus alongside St. Augustine, or if you're fancy, St. Augustine? Uh, is Toni Morrison an author whose work students ought to know? That's not much of a live question anymore. I mean, if you're wondering if the jury's still out on Toni Morrison, no, the jury is not out. Uh, Toni Morrison is on the syllabus. She will stay there. Now, she too, just like St. Augustine, can be invoked and quoted without actually being read or understood. Um, many works on the syllabus end up that way. Um, and the narrative of how Toni Morrison crashed the canon can be celebrated or lamented, but it is largely settled. The Stanford canon debates, uh, the best known of several canon debates, stand as a past plot point on a still unfolding storyline about the extent to which the question of who is in the classroom or who is in the lecture hall or the plaza can or should shape the work that goes on there or the words that are spoken or heard there. So the ongoing discussion that draws from the Stanford canon debates is, is kind of a franchise in which new characters um, decrying the results of political correctness or decrying the problems of multiculturalism and how they're ruining higher education, somebody like Milo Yiannopoulos or Richard Spencer, these new characters that show up, they appear alongside older characters who either took part in the earlier episode or its immediate aftermath. People like William Bennett, who was on the campus at Stanford and took part in the debates, or Dinesh D'Souza, who wrote about them soon after and helped sustain them in the public mind. Roger Kimball, uh, who has had a long career commenting on, lamenting the consequences of this change in higher education. Or Peter Thiel. Now, I have to say, looking at things in retrospect, that Peter Thiel is probably the breakout star of the Stanford canon debates in terms of being able to uh, leverage that into uh, a long and promising career doing many influential things. He was one of the conservative students who he f helped found the Stanford Review, uh, which was a counterpart to the Dartmouth Review, conservative or organ of opinion on campus. He helped bring William Bennett to the campus while the, these debates were unfolding in 1988. In the 1990s, Peter wrote a book called The Diversity Myth, a book in which he returned again and again to the Stanford faculty's decision to change the reading list as the original sin by which multiculturalism fully and forever spoiled the garden of the university. Um, dissatisfied with what higher education had become or with what he thought it had become. Peter Thiel started a fellowship program that paid promising students not to go to college. Uh, ironically, or not, now that fellowship program is just as hard to get into as Stanford itself. And Peter Thiel, who was on the losing side of the cannon wars at Stanford, has stepped into the winner's circle as a contrarian Silicon Valley conservative who backed Donald Trump. He is well positioned for the next episode in the unfolding story of humanities education in the United States. I don't know what this episode will be called, maybe Peter Thiel's Revenge, I don't know. Uh, in any case, it is the case that some of the bit players and major players from earlier iterations of campus controversies still play a role today 
in keeping such controversies in the spotlight for an audience made up of older viewers who saw the original and some younger folks who are just now tuning in for the sequels. But sometimes it seems that what we're seeing now with campus controversies is not so much a sequel as it is a reperformance, a reproduction, a new production of old arguments. Debates about political correctness, campus speech codes, provocateurs and counter protesters, uh, testimonies of students from across the ideological and political spectrum who find the campus climate not just uncomfortable for one reason or another, but truly harmful or toxic. Liberal professors and ham-handed administrators whose initial attempts to forestall a public relations disaster end up backfiring, always. And always, along with these on-campus actors, there is always a chorus of viewers and readers and commentators who are not personally connected to this or that campus where some controversy is going down, uh, not personally involved in this or that controversy, but who play a role in spreading the outrage and pronouncing the usual platitudes and pieties about it. Maybe today we here in this room can be part of that chorus talking about the campus culture wars. We have seen this movie before and somehow it keeps getting remade. Why? Why remake Star Trek? Well, how many versions of Batman do we need? How many different times are we going to meet a new Spider-Man or to shift back to campus? How many times are we going to hear and debate the question of whether or not it's appropriate for students to don blackface? How, how long will that question be discussed as a, a matter for serious debate? Um, maybe for everybody in this room, I'm sure knows how to answer that question, but for the sake of the five people watching on YouTube at home, no, it's never appropriate to wear blackface. I've answered the question. If you're wondering, the answer is no, you don't wear blackface to a costume party. No, uh, you don't get to use the N-word because you heard it in a rap song. And not getting to use that word is not the first step down a slippery slope to censorship and the loss of intellectual freedom. No, the insistence that academic conferences should include uh, panels that have women and scholars of color and queer scholars is not the degradation of intellectual standards. If folks can't frame a conversation in a way that would draw interest and participation and engagement from people with diverse perspectives and viewpoints, then maybe those folks are asking bad, boring questions. Speaking of bad questions, let me get back to my arguably bad analogy about the campus culture wars as film franchise reboots. Here's the thing about film franchises. They are properties. They belong to production companies. Franchises can be bought and sold. Disney bought Lucasfilms, so they got Star Wars and Indiana Jones, another franchise. Franchises include not just the films already made, but the rights to the characters and the costume designs and any storyline that might include them. And once a studio has sunk some money into building or acquiring a franchise. They can revisit or revive it, reboot it to get more return on their sunk costs, to get yet another return on their investment. Franchises have fans. They're proven. Their characters are already known and loved or known and hated. The features of their genre are always familiar. They can be counted on to draw a loyal demographic back to the theater. So reboots are often a question of sunk costs and certain rewards. So how does that relate to the campus culture wars? Well, there are some sunk costs involved in the production and distribution of campus conflicts for the benefit of a broader audience. The Olin Foundation bankrolled conservative student publications like the Stanford Review, where Peter Thiel got his start, 
or the Dartmouth Review, where Dinesh D'Souza got his start. The Olin Foundation spent itself dry, spent itself into, into uh, liquidation by design, funding grassroots efforts to gin up outrage about political correctness run amok, as the familiar phrase has it. The Olin Foundation deliberately spent itself out of business, uh, but the Bradley Foundation stepped in. The Rodney Fund stepped in. Here's where Scott's gonna wonder why he invited me. The Richard DeVos Foundation, uh, now known as the DeVos Urban Leadership Initiative, stepped in. For several years, the DeVos Foundation was a consistent donor to an organization called the Leadership Institute, a right-wing organization founded by Morton Blackwell, who's a Louisiana Republican. And the aim of this organization was and is to fund and train conservative journalists and cultural commentators. The Leadership Institute is probably familiar to many, many uh, in the audience for their website, Campus Reform. It's a website that encourages students across the country to anonymously send in tips about the liberal bias of their professors. In 2009, the website's about page, this is campusreform.org, you can go there and file a report about my liberal bias any time, it's all right, uh, said, <laughs> said that campus reform's mission was to provide conservative activists with the resources, networking, capabilities, and skills they need to revolutionize the struggle against leftist bias and abuse on college campuses. That was what their about page said originally. Now they're a little more cagey. If you go to the site's page today, you encounter a claim to objectivity. Um, as a watchdog to the nation's higher education system, the website reads, campus reform exposes bias and abuse, no mention of what kind of bias and abuse, on the nation's college campuses. Our team of professional journalists works alongside student activists and student journalists, no mention on what kind of politics these activists or journalists are expected to have, student activists and student journalists to report on the conduct and misconduct of university administrators, faculty, and students. Campus reform holds itself to rigorous journalism standards and strives to present each story with accuracy, objectivity, and public accountability. But of course, each story on their website furthers a larger narrative already sketched out by William F. Buckley and later Dinesh D'Souza and today Milo Yiannopoulos. The narrative of liberal bias, political correctness as a menace to free speech and so forth. But if you're looking for campus reform, for instance, to report on how Stanford University recently tried to prohibit a professor from using a photograph of Donald Trump in a poster advertising a conference about Title IX, a case where the university was trying to squelch the free speech or free expression of a faculty member, uh, you will look in vain. <laughs> the purpose of campus reform and sites like it is not to report in even-handed fashion on all instances of possible bias on campus. It's to capitalize on an already established narrative of right-wing grievance about liberal indoctrination. Now, what do I mean by capitalize? Other than titillating readers who may enjoy revisiting campus controversies, what is the purpose of a site like Campus Reform, which aims to, to keep campus controversies alive and spread them to broader audiences. Why would conservative donors spend money on a media enterprise whose aim is to delegitimize higher education? Are they just anti-intellectual? Do they just have it in for Stanford and Yale and Dartmouth and Princeton on principle? I don't think so. Instead, I think what's happened is that some of these conservative foundations over the years have demonstrated that they recognize that education has long been considered a public good in the United States. And for a few decades after World War II, 
even college education, not just education more broadly, but even college education, which used to be reserved for the elites, um, or used to be only accessible to the elites. Even college education was treated as a public good that should be available to citizens from every socioeconomic class, from every background. But if society treats education broadly construed as a public good, where then is the opening for private enterprise? Where then can the market move in? You can't monetize what you can't privatize. And you can't privatize something that people cherish and want to keep safe from the incursions of the market. How do you monetize American education? By convincing people that as it is, it's not worth keeping. My research on the culture wars in the 1980s has bled into and fed into and poured into um, the reception of those 1980s battles. And what I found in my research, um, with the help of some other scholars, Ellen Messer Davidow is probably um, most instrumental in helping me frame this, what I found is that invocations of, say, the canon debates at Stanford were often used very frequently in arguments for charter schools, arguments for the privatization of once public educational systems. The argument goes something like this. The colleges are filled with liberal bias. They are destroying the foundations of Western civilization. Students who go to these places will not get an education. It's trickling down into teacher training. And we must do something to save our children. So. Send them to our charter school, let our charter school company take charge and save the youth for the future. The reason some campus controversies seem to keep reappearing is because they sell well and they sell other ideas that have absolutely nothing to do with concern about free speech and everything to do with how to make a buck. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, again, thank you for inviting me back. I was here a couple of years ago and I gave a, a talk on a similar uh, topic. I'm interested in politics and higher education, all kinds of different dimensions of politics and higher education. But I'm a little different in some respects because I'm a conservative, uh, I'm a conservative Republican. I've been out in the world in that respect my entire career. And I became interested in studying how the ideological disposition, the leftist disposition of higher education, affects the academy itself. And many of the answers I came to were surprising. And I'm going to talk today a little bit about the work that I've been doing more recently and what this says about the debate about politics and higher ed in general. Uh, it's, called, it's about the persuasion paradox. And I'll talk to you a little bit about what that means. That the left enjoys a dominant position in higher education is, is almost beyond dispute. Every survey going back almost 100 years shows that the faculty are much more uh, further to the left in the academy than they are in the general public. It's not just that they're more Democrat. On the specific issues, they're much further to the left. And even the traditionally conservative disciplines, political science, philosophy, economics, there is still a very lopsided bias, three to one, five to one, in favor of Democrat professors over Republicans. There's almost no place in the institution of higher education where conservatives are at parity. So that's the, the, the starting point. But what we're finding through different research in different ways is that the beliefs of the students over the course of four years doesn't much change. And this is part of what I'm going to talk about is the persuasion paradox. We have left-wing educators teaching students, and their beliefs remain from, one, from year one to year four largely the same. 
And this is a, a table from a book that we're working on right now, and this is an extension of some work that I've done before, where the yellow line represents uh, static. So at the bottom we have where they start, and the top uh, axis is where they end up. And a vast majority of the students have roughly the same ideological mix of beliefs when they start as when they finish. We see some dynamic movement, but the, the movement goes in both directions. Some students get more conservative, some get more liberal. We find this in the book that we have, The Still Divided Academy. They tend to move more liberal on the social dimension, and they tend to move a little more conservative on the economic dimensions. And so what's interesting is that you will see more drifting to the left than you will to the right. So there is some potential evidence that there, there's some liberalizing effect, but it's relatively minor over the whole scheme of their political beliefs. So this is the persuasion paradox, how from year one to year four, you see very little change in the students' beliefs. And I wrote an article about this with so many left-leaning college professors, why is there so little ideological movement among undergraduates? This is the, uh, you know what this is? Okay, yes. This is the, the left, leftist professor who was wanting to use some muscle to get somebody off the college campus. Uh, Fox News like to pick on her for about a week. Well, I wrote an article July 15, 2013 for Inside Higher Ed called about the persuasion paradox. And in the article, I laid out five potential theories for why it is that students seem so ideologically stable, notwithstanding the environment in which they're immersed. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what progress we've made on these five dimensions, because at the time there were a lot of holes still in the research, and we're starting to fill those holes in. And I'll talk to you a little bit about what we have discovered. So I'll go through the explanations one at a time. Uh, one is that faculty truly are committed to impartiality. And this is an explanation I get from my liberal colleagues. Oh, we really don't uh, indoctrinate students. We're not really biased. We, we, we throw those pitches right down the middle. And I think most of them believe that, and some of them might even succeed. But if it was an equal mix of Republicans and Democrats, it wouldn't matter. So what we do is we look at some measures. How to, for example, how do faculty treat each other? Do they report evidence of uh, bias or harassment on the basis of politics? And in our book, we found very little evidence, Republicans, independents, Democrats, that on the issue of politics, they felt they were ever treated badly. They were ever victimized. This doesn't take away from the fact that it does happen, and we can see some very serious examples that are often promoted in Fox News, but most faculty don't have this experience, and in fact, in our book, we also show that most students don't report this feeling of victimization. If we look at something as, as interesting as publishing, so this is the axis that shows how liberal the professor is, and this is how much they publish. What we find is that the professors who are, if we look in the social sciences, there's relatively little difference between liberal and conservative professors in terms of publishing. Where we do see a difference, where they, the liberal professors seem to publish a lot more is not in the social sciences and the humanities, it's in the hard sciences. That's hard to explain in terms of ideological bias. It's not that they were the uh, physicists who are conservative are not getting published as much because of their conservatism. It might be something about their personality that leads them toward the research field or toward the teaching field. So we do find, and this is what we're going to talk about in the book that we're writing now, that when you look at high school, for example, students in high school, in the social sciences, arts, sciences, and the professional fields, conservatives report having higher grades and higher GPAs than their liberal counterparts. When we fast forward four years later and look at the same students, it's reversed. Is this ideology? Is this, is this because of discrimination? It's possible. It's also possible that maybe when the conservatives are away from home and they're in an environment where they don't have as much structure and control, they don't do as well as they did when they were living home. There's a lot of reasons to explain what's happening here, but one possibility is it might be bias. And this, this difference holds consistently when you control for every imaginable variable. The liberal students seem to do better when they get to the end of their career. And so we're going to try to unlock why. Number two, leftist influence often precedes college coursework. Now, one of my theories was you can't indoctrinate students if they're already indoctrinated. Students have a lot of signals, not just college, from high school, from the media, from their parents, from their peers. And when you look at what students believe going into their first year, it's actually already pretty liberal when compared to the rest of the population. So when people say, oh, look at the, how liberal the students are when they're in college, it's not necessarily the college that did it. If they started that way, we can't blame higher education. And we talk about this in our book. And these are data from the Higher Education Research Institute, and this shows uh, views 
uh, first year students agree that same sex couples should have the, the right uh, to legal marriage status. And we see that over time, the acceptance of that principle goes up in all groups. And you might say, well, look at this, they're, they're getting more liberal. But so is the general population. So where we see movement, we see movement in a societal context, which then raises the question, is this really the influence of higher education? Uh, number three, many students aren't listening. I love this one. One of my colleagues said, you know, I wish I could indoctrinate my students. I can't even get them to do the reading. One theory of public opinion uh, advanced by John Zoller points out that non-ideological citizens are the easiest to persuade because they don't have a lot of pre-organized ideas. They haven't taken a lot of firm stances. You can really change their minds if you try to persuade them. The problem is in the general public, non-ideological citizens are least inclined to listen to political arguments or even understand their significance. And this same theory may apply to students. Students may, who are most vulnerable to persuasion, the moderates, ones who have no pre-existing beliefs, if a professor is spouting off in class, either they don't care or they don't necessarily understand. So they have a certain immunity from being indoctrinated because of their lack of interest. And we also notice, and this is from other research we've done, that students are really good at figuring out the politics of their professors. Within a week, even when they think they're being impartial, the students can usually peg their professor's politics within one, uh, on a five-point scale, within, within one point. So the fact that they know, even though the professor is trying to be impartial, what their professor is, means that if they don't agree with those positions, they'll put up the blinders and they will not be persuaded. So students t tend to tune out, which probably explains one of the reasons that they're so strong in their beliefs. Number four, conservative students deliberately avoid ideological minefields. As a conservative in college, I remember taking a few courses. One was in sociology, and the professor was really liberal. She was really nice, but she was really liberal, and I never took another sociology course again because I didn't feel like she really was, was being objective. So my theory was maybe when the students take college courses and they find courses that are very liberal field that make them uncomfortable or make them feel like it's not being a fair course, they don't take them again or they switch majors. But in our newest research, we find that the amount of switching of majors is the same between conservative and liberal students. So we don't see that conservatives are switching majors in large numbers compared to liberal students. But what we do find is that whereas there's uniform uh, switching of majors by ideology, we do see some evidence that there are some rational changes that we would expect based on ideology where students are, for example, bailing out of majors like conservatives are getting out of anthropology, uh, whereas the liberal students are getting into anthropology. We see, um, liberal students getting uh, into, into drama more. We see uh, conservatives getting out of e English and liberal students getting into English. Things that are consistent with the idea that ideology may be a driving force, but it's not a big driving force. If anything, it's small. So it's not that this is a major shield against uh, indoctrination. Students seem to go through their major and it doesn't seem to bother them too much because ideology is not a great predictor of what majors they switch into and which majors they switch out of. It's noteworthy though, political science, um, the ones bailing out of political science are the moderates. The liberals and conservatives seem to like that field. If you're a squishy moderate, you want to do something else. Finally, there is the fifth explanation. It's one put forward by uh, Stephen Balch, former uh, president of the National Association of Scholars, that the persuasion paradox is an illusion that it's, it's really happening, there is indoctrination going on, but it may not be going on across the entire political spectrum, and it may not be happening at all the colleges and universities, community colleges, not very prestigious four-year colleges, the professors are more conservative. And his theory is that if it's happening in the Ivy League, if it's happening at the elite institutions, that's enough. Because even a small indoctrination of the right groups of people will gradually have an effect on the culture and will change society over time. And this is a, from our book and it shows how if you look at the more prestigious universities, they tend to be more Democrat, but more importantly, they hold much more liberal beliefs. So the more prestigious the university, the heavier the concentration of liberals and Democrats. And Balch's argument is maybe that's where this is taking place because our studies of higher ed and ideological drift are usually focused on the aggregate, not on the elites. Well, we're looking at this question in our new book. And one of the things you'll notice is that there is some evidence that as you move to the more prestigious institutions, you have a higher level of ideological drift to the left. So this is, this is movement to the left, and you can see it's 
much higher at the very prestigious universities. And in fact, in the lower universities, they might even be drifting right slightly, although uh, this is not necessary within the statistical significance for some of the middle categories. If you look at their ideological views, so this isn't just their views on, um, so this is what their beliefs is shifting over time, and this is how they self-describe their ideology. And again, you tend to see students thinking of themselves as more liberal when they go to the more prestigious schools. So this doesn't validate this idea, but it provides some tantalizing evidence that maybe if there is ideological shifting going on, it may be occurring more at the more elite institutions, which are the ones that tend to drive the culture over time. So the persuasion paradox, what have we learned? Basically, we've learned it's complicated. There are probably elements of all of these explanations occurring simultaneously, and not one of them really stands out as the definitive explanation, which means that we're going to spend years trying to sort this out and unpack this controversy over time. And finally, and this is what we're doing in our new book, we're going to take a lot of this data, looking at students in their first and their fourth years, and looking from every conceivable perspective on how politics and ideology affects them and what are the drivers of their success. So, you know, do liberal faculty favor liberal students? We're going to examine GPAs and see if there is there evidence that there's some ideological bias in the grading system. We're going to examine uh, do right-leaning students flee liberal majors, something I've talked about already. Uh, how do conservative students ex uh, experience differ from liberal students and why? Their perceptions of their own experience in college. And how can we make the climate more welcoming to both right and left-leaning students? My underlying bias in all of this is that we need ideological diversity to make education work. I think that conservatives, in fact, get more out of higher education than liberal students because they're exposed to new ideas. It challenges what they believe. It forces them to rethink their beliefs, and if you're surrounded by people who agree with you all the time, you're not growing as much as you should be. It would be just as bad if it were all liberal as all conservative. So really what this is all about for us is learning what are the causes and drivers that make ideology lopsided, and what can we do to improve the climate so that people who are conservative feel more welcome so that their ideas can be promoted in a way that allows for that dialogue, but also in a way, if the, if the ideology is a little more mixed in higher education, it benefits the liberal students so they can see the alternative worldview and understand that, they're, that highly educated people sometimes vote Republican. Thank you. Hi, thank you. That was a wonderful set of, of talks. Um, I wanted to first offer a, a comment uh, and then a question. I'm still trying to figure out how to frame it in my mind. Uh, I don't think I'll fully succeed by the time I get to that. Uh, the comment uh, is directed at Matthew. You went through five explanations. Mm -hmm. uh, a sixth possible one is related to some recent research that's being done by folks like John Hibbing, mm -hmm. suggesting that, in fact, there might be a genetic component, a heritable component, to political dispositions that's related to, for instance, some of the uh, big five personality dimensions where openness to new experience is linked to stronger liberalism, higher conscientiousness and stronger conservatism, disgust reactions, things like that. Yeah. And I don't think that's inconsistent with the others, but that might play some kind of a role. It, it does. I, I agree. And actually, I, I've, I've read that and I've read some other work along those lines. And find, I, I think it's interesting, it's potentially important, and it's scary. Yes. Because <laughs> the idea that you know, my conservative leanings have something to do with my, my genetic makeup is, mm -hmm. is a little depressing because we hope we come to these beliefs based on some kind of rational thought. But that's definitely something that we have to kind of look at. It's a little outside of what I can do. But that kind of thinking and that kind of research should be incorporated into the larger theory. So yes, I totally agree. Yeah, I, I agree. I have mixed reactions to that as well when I really think about it. Um, the question, uh, and again, I'm not going to do, I think, a very good job uh, of asking this, uh, but, but this relates to things from all three of your talks, um, has to do with identity politics and victim mentality. Um, and uh, this is something that really concerns me because I think uh, when it gets to the civil rights movement, various forms of activism, things that I really tend to support as a liberal, um, I realize that in some sense identity politics goes hand in hand with those things in a very positive sense that we need to recognize that certain groups have been discriminated against. They have been victimized uh, either by other groups of people or in an institutional fashion or what have you. Um, and it used to be that it was more the conservative side that was very, very critical of these things, saying liberals are destroying the fabric of society, the chance of having a civil cohesive 
society uh, where we can respect one another by forcing people to adopt identity politics and convincing people that groups of people that they are victims and making them angry. And I used to largely be dismissive of this as a fairly liberal person, but I'm beginning to change my mind on these things. Uh, for one thing, we're finding more and more liberal writers, sociologists, uh, uh, political scientists, people like, for instance, Robert Putnam, who are beginning to be concerned about exactly the same things, that yes, you know, uh, people who support a, a very diverse multicultural society, but are saying we at the same time needed to have a shared sense of pride, a shared sense of being in this together, maybe even a shared sense of rituals and traditions in order to make this society work. Um, so, so there's that aspect of it. And there's also, of course, a, a growing body of research from my own field, psychology, uh, that really does uh, support the notion that the more people uh, feel like they are victims, uh, the more likely they are to engage in all sorts of antisocial behaviors that have absolutely nothing to do with activism, mm -hmm. uh, whether it has feeling entitled to cheat and, and litter and, and a decrease in empathy towards others who are not the same as you. Mm -hmm. um, and this has been found in laboratory studies uh, with the most minor forms of victimization possible. I su suspect that it's much stronger when it's a real perceived victimization against an entire group that you identify with. Yeah. Um, and I think this is a growing phenomenon because again, I do think that in the past, the left more than the right tended to really emphasize these things. Yes, you've been a victim. Yes, you've been a victim. Yes, you've been a victim. You need to fight for your rights. Now it seems like it's an equal opportunity offender. Over the last decade in particular, watching Fox News and other conservative outlets convincing uh, white men, you are now victims. You know, evangelical Christians, you're being victimized and so on and so forth. It's like now everybody is a member of a victim class. And I really worry about this. How do we in fact encourage people to stand up for their rights and to uh, uh, really uh, uh, honor their roots and their own group identities without falling into this kind of a trap that I think is going to prevent the type of civil discourse that this entire project over the weekend has been all about. I can, I can jump in on that. I'm concerned that, that uh, activists like David Horowitz, for example, who talk about uh, all, the, all the horror stories in the higher ed, stu students are victimized by liberal professors, things that do happen, he highlights them. But he paints them as almost the norm. And it's creating this victimization culture in higher education where conservatives feel like they're just under siege all the time. And there are some challenges. I had them myself. Uh, it's not all easy, but it's much more manageable than most conservatives understand. I've had a very happy career. I, I, I like my colleagues. I get along with them wonderfully. Uh, there are times I've got to bob and weave a little bit, but for the most part, it's, it's achievable. So I'm worried that this victim mentality that conservatives are beginning to develop will cause them not to go to college and further exacerbate the gap between liberals and conservatives in higher ed. So I, I have this personal view that I want to minimize this view of victimization, one, because it's not factually based, and second, because it actually increases a problem that I think higher education suffers from right now. Um, I have a, actually more of an observation for Professor Burnett uh, than a question. Um, I made most of my career uh, in the vast right-wing conspiracy and uh, was highly involved in the uh, sorts of things that you talked about. Uh, but that causes me to uh, be puzzled by your account uh, because I would narrate, especially with respect to the money, but also re with respect to the attention, uh, that the political, political correctness on campus was a sort of a 90s thing, uh, 80s and 90s thing, uh, and there was lots of money in the 80s and 90s for that. But even at a place like ISI, by the early 2000s, there was the sense that, well, you know, postmodernism is kind of dead now. It's not moving forward. Uh, the worst abuses uh, aren't popping up as often anymore. Uh, and we kind of should move along and stop beating this dead horse. It's been a long time since uh, Dinesh D'Souza wrote his book. Um, at the same time, in 2008, with the economic collapse, the money dried up uh, because the right of center money uh, shifted to an all hands on deck emergency to limit the growth of government under the conditions of the recession. And there was less money uh, for this kind of cultural war stuff. Uh, and so that makes me puzzled by the recent reboot of the issue. Mm -hmm. 
uh, because it doesn't seem to have a cause. Uh, I can't see the cause, at least on our side. Uh, and I would offer a hypothesis, mm -hmm. uh, which I don't really know. Uh, but it strikes me that uh, foreseeing, well, two things. One, after the 2012 election, Obama becomes a lame duck president. Uh, he needs to do good things for his constituency. He therefore has the Office of Civil Rights at the Education Department write dear colleague letters and intervenes in the higher education world, which is part of the coalition, uh, in a way that they would want. Uh, and so you create a regulatory structure which is more offensive to the right than it had been up till now. Things That's have kind of, yeah. kind of settled down, and so all of a sudden something erupts again that wasn't erupting before. Uh, second possibility uh, is that um, uh, money on the left side uh, sees that in 2016, uh, it'll be harder for Hillary to win against a Republican than it was for Obama, potentially, because she's not black. Uh, and blacks may not turn out in the numbers uh, that they need to, to win. And so you need to mobilize the black community. Uh, and so money moves in this direction uh, to, for example, help Black Lives Matter along. And there's a kind of blowback onto the campus from this larger social movement uh, which itself is heavily funded on the left. And so, again, things happen <clears throat> that are different. Uh, and so I guess my main point is that, uh, at least on the right, I do understand that money on the right side in the 80s and 90s uh, certainly helped that along. Uh, but I can't, I myself can't understand why it came back seemingly so heavily in the last four years. Uh, and I don't see the causal levers on the right for that. I'm not sure I see the causal levers on the left either, but I, I, think, um, I think you're not wrong to, to suggest a, a, an emergent or a kind of a renewed awareness of the, of the, the fraughtness of, of the coming political moment and kind of both, both camps or both approaches to... Um, it, Higher education is still, despite the efforts of, of, of various groups to delegitimize it or, or demonize it in some way, um, is still very well regarded by many Americans. It's, it's, I didn't get to my never ending story part because I didn't gauge my time. Um, but there is this other thing about higher education and about battles over higher education. They are a sign that in our you know, cynical, materialistic age, there are still things that people value enough to, to, to contend for, to fight over, battles of students, earnest young people going toe to toe over issues that they believe really matter. That is a, a heartening sign, it's a sign of hope that, that the contestation itself over education as something uh, worth shaping, worth keeping, worth um, guarding from either side of the political spectrum. Um, that means that the university, for all its flaws and for all the, all the ways that it has been diminished, um, uh, rightly or wrongly, in the public eye, is still a treasure to people. And that gives me hope. Yeah. I would say, um, in thinking about that, I, in my career, I've experienced the Office of Civil Rights in a different way that, that many of the scholarships that were available to, uh, to students of color uh, that created a certain kind of access and entry into to what we would call the middle class had been uh, cut away, had been cut away during uh, previous administrations and that sort of thing, and I think that has a lasting effect. With regard to, to uh, to this movement for black lives and, and, and maybe the implications that it would have on campus, uh, I, I think about that in the same way that I think about uh, uh, in the, in the post-war uh, period, uh, many people argued that, that at the base or, or behind all of these civil rights movements, these black power movements and this sort of thing were, were, were the communists. And, uh, who, were, who were funding this and strategizing these kinds of things. And I always thought that might be the most racist thing I'd ever heard, that, that black people didn't realize or understand that they were being oppressed on their own, mm 
Uh, and, and, and in that way, uh, I also think that, that when these young people on college campuses and off uh, recognize that you could go to high school and graduate but still get shot down, you could uh, do the things that, that other young people do and still get arrested or hurt and, and that sort of thing, that it was an awakening in a, in a sorts. Part of the reason I think it became uh, 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 these, these uprisings on campus, and they're more than 75, 80 campuses at one point were facing demands. Uh, they saw it on the streets. And this is where I say that, that, that uh, these ivy walls can't prevent the, the social movements of the time from seeping onto campus. And so, so I think that's, that's a part of it. And the last thing I'll say uh, was to the first question uh, about uh, uh, victim, the, the sense of being a victim and that sort of thing. I, I, I always walk easy around these things, or, or walk light. Um, I, I try not to deal in terms uh, like victims. I try not to use terms like race card uh, um, uh, and, and, and these kinds of things. Uh, because one is, I don't know who made these terms up. And, and, and I'm not sure that you were smart enough to, to, to make these things up. The second part of it is, well, who's dealing the daggone cards? Yeah, uh, anyhow, I'm digressing. <laughs> My point in all of it is, if, if we want to make up terms, particularly uh, for those who are feeling pinched but still going forward, then I, I call them survivors. The students that I write about in this post-war period uh, survived a great deal of, of uh, outright uh, types of racism and, and, and that sort of thing, but also just a certain kind of neglect and isolation uh, that is not healthy for the soul. And so, so. Um, I'm always careful. I'm always careful about those kinds of things, particularly uh, when, when these things switch around. Uh, sometimes bullies uh, feign victimhood, uh, and it works well for them rhetorically and, and that sort of thing. So I, yeah.